for the next speaker, I would introduce an old friend, uh, Professor <laughs> Glenn, Glenn Pierce. Um, uh, Professor Glenn Pierce of the University of Texas at, uh, at Austin, who will speak to us on images of crafts and craftsmanship in the visual arts of the early Byzantine world. Glenn. Well, <coughs> I want to um, echo Professor Arthur's Professor Arthur's, excuse me, Professor Arthur's um, thanks to the organizers, particularly Salvatore Cosentino, um, who I met for the first time in Ravenna in 2005 in September, um, a really memorable two weeks. I'm very grateful to him for the invitation in order to renew that, that friendship. It also means a lot to me to be introduced unexpectedly by Tony Cutler. Um, as you'll see from my introduction, I owe him a great deal in this paper. Um, and I'd like to also um, thank the um, representatives from Ravenna this morning who gave a very um, compelling presentation or series of presentations of why we should go to Ravenna um, for reasons that historians may not recognize immediately. But I was especially um, taken by Nadia Corboni's um, presentation about the campaign for Ravenna 2019, and I'm wearing the button very proudly now. Um, I, ho I wish them all the success, but um, there was one um, sentence that she produced which I um, really admired from selfish reasons and I would, if I were able to change the title of my talk, um, use, which was, I transform, therefore we are. And you'll see why that um, is especially apropos to what I'm going to talk about. So I enter into this discussion with the fear that appropriate modesty causes. Treating craft in the late antique world, let alone the Middle Ages, is a humbling enterprise not less for the company here, for Professor Cutler has for over 20 years been examining with typical vigor and incisiveness just these issues of maker, making, and made to provide a cognate-filled triad that covers the range of craft's life. He's presented compelling arguments and careful analyses, and he has treated that range without neglecting the thing at the center of craft's process. So I'm reacting to the weight and value, as I perceive them, of previous scholarship and using other positions described and applied by scholars in other fields as well. In the first place, my insistence, as you'll see, on relation amongst all agents, makers, things, and users, comes from recent work in anthropology, primarily Tim Ingold, who allows me to argue for a world livelier than we admit normally for our historical subjects and for ourselves. In this way, Kraft's self-knowing process, a doing that thinks rather than relying on rote learning and repetition, is a way into arguing for an extended mind that th brings things into the world. I would argue for the effective persuasion that Kraft can carry out in the world. Its thinking, formed but not determined by the maker, is in force and difficult to resist. I want also to address aspects of revision and renovation that implicate issues of, dis of distributed authorship, distributed authorship, in which objects carry marks of multiple traces of renovation and remaking. Finally, for now, I want to focus on wonder, sensations of perplexity and astonishment that made things cause, as a way of approaching cultural models of makers and the effects and lives of the things they make. The lives of almost all of the women and men who performed any kind of specialized work in late antiquity are invisible to us now. Representations like the sarcophagus, though early for my purposes, show some of the realia of a studio, one supposes, but of course this image is not transparent to process. Yet it shows a pondering painter, his materials, and the results of thought-filled process. The material results of that work, which is craft, tell us almost all we can know about the skills and knowledge of those workers or craftsmen. They scarcely reveal aspects of craftsmen's beliefs or aspirations in ways that we can understand now. But made things can demonstrate how craftsmen use their work to gain the world a thing, a letting appear that confirmed, extended, and amplified their agency. I take the letting appear, or erscheinen lassen, 
from Martin Heidegger. In his essay, Bauen, Von, and Denken, he described techni as a dynamic process of, bring, of bringing into being rather than a stamp of mind on world. My point is that humans and materials work together in a mutually enlivening process of more or less ability or interest and self-articulation on the part of either. Basket weaving is an, ex an excellent example of this process. And as in ancient art, with little technological change and global applications, it allows us to see how weavers still manipulate raw materials into new, practical, pleasing objects. And yet weavers, like all craftsmen, do not impose an order or image. They must work with and on the material, just as the material works on and with them. Moreover, the work is not simply performed by a person emptied of mind and initiative, fully trained to produce and wrote. It does not eliminate creativity and free expression because materials always insist on their equal role. Baskets survive from the late antique world, mainly from Egypt, and anthropological work in that country also reveals essential features of making. The craft depends on intense concentration and full-bodied engagement with materials. But this precious equilibrium between attention to materials and applications of acquired knowledge is also seen in other contexts, like modern workshops, in which great skill is self-maintained at great cost in a battle to ensure quality and output. Basket making is likewise improvisational, to some extent, while maintaining a need for results. That is a little obvious, maybe. But the point is that, unlike mechanical production, handicraft is process, and the environmental material elements matter as much as the skill and strength of the maker. Where one makes a basket, indoors or outdoors, with a firm set or handheld, with resistant strands or pliant, all these are participants with maker in a process that does not need, maybe can't have, a predetermined outcome. Moreover, baskets have no frame, no inside or outside, because wrapping transverse fibers make them alternately inside and outside. That organic quality makes it sometimes difficult to know when a basket's finished, though when it is finished, it can last a very long time. The basket then emerges in a mutual agreement through an interaction of skilled action and materials, and the repetitive, attentive action makes the resultant thing regular and complete. The acquisition and development of such skills is a social activity, naturally, and in this world, they took place in workshops with master apprentice frameworks. That type of learning then could not really be called independent, nor is it a fully integrated activity shared between teacher and pupil. It leads by example, in fact, to another kind of knowledge that has been called a material consciousness. That is, a way of knowing that develops through sensitive, attentive familiarity with materials. This kind of knowledge operates perhaps as a basis for what Richard Sennett calls a dialogic social behavior. And if that's so, it comes out of those particular master-apprentice and maker-material relationships. Beyond the social ramifications, that set of relationships enlarges the maker's experience and knowledge of the world. As Peter Dormer wrote, craft knowledge is genuine knowledge. To possess it in any form is to see the world in an enriched way compared with someone who does not possess it. Anna Odland Portish tells a story about a craftswoman in Kazakhstan who constantly eyed and covered, coveted her niece's new outfit until she could manage to persuade that girl to relinquish it to her so that she could make a wall hanging from the yarn. Now, that, that's maybe not the most likable example one could adduce, but this story reveals the particular acuity with which craftsmen look at the world, not as a passive field, but as a realm for creative engagement and fashioning and stealing. In that sense, baskets are both the result of a set of actions between maker and materials and answering a vast number of needs in the world for containing storage and transport. The objects themselves are modest, almost unremarkable, but they are found in a large number of contexts and in endless forms and sizes. Domestic and ecclesiastic uses are obvious. Their adaptability is remarkable, just the same, such as being used for insulating shutters in late antique houses in Egypt. Holding and containing are natural uses to which these things have always been put, but they have added valences when they are represented in late antique art as sources of bounty. So, for example, at San Vitale, baskets, among other things, contain the richness of paradise, and in other scenes, 
like the miracle of the loaves and fishes, though this image is not maybe the best example, they're vessels of miraculous plenitude. These modest things, then, are impressive distillations of the dynamic relationship among makers and materials, of the work that happens in the flows of matter and attentive, evolving, reactive skill by which thing and maker reciprocally emerge. This model, in general terms, applies equally well to humble objects, like baskets, as it does to elevated categories, like metalworking, bronze casting, mosaic, and painting. Just as all these categories of making belong to a more undifferentiated group of activities than they do for us in our fine art traditions, so all these ways of making take part in the same cooperative world-making actions and energies. So my questions are something like this. Can, can worked materials and the artisan's work form and change how we understand nature or life? And can the raw materials themselves also determine a craftsman's approach, experience, and outcome? Such questions have a history, and materials are not absolute in the world, because they have explanations and functions that change with period and culture. So engaging in a kind of materialist iconology can open up some ways materials and their worked states participate in a world-defining process. How, does one ex how one explains the materiality of reeds and twigs, for example, might be one way into the inherent meaning of their worked forms. Likewise, to travel to the other end of the spectrum of material values, how one explains the meaning of gold as mineral and medium should tell us a great deal about what the material and resultant thing did in its culture. So this small gold box in the Menil collection does a great deal still. But it does more when its material explanations are examined and its worked qualities are explored. Only in this way can we approach the particular work the material and its partnering maker did and how that thing went to work in its world. The box is small scale, and I want to talk about wonder and the miniature too, but in the first place, I want to address what gold did in late antiquity. By its doing, I mean the explanations that culture had for its materiality. That understanding goes back at least to classical antiquity, and it strikingly undermines our understanding of materials as inert. The geology is based on mixtures of elements in that world, and most metals were thought to be primarily water-based, that is, water trapped in the earth and hardened into metals like gold and silver and so on. This elemental combining, then, is an animating force in the earth, rather like a vital force that runs through creation, like a lifeblood. Aristotle spoke of the spirit and the moisture within the earth that combined with life heat to produce these metals. In some way that Aristotle himself couldn't explain, that combination charged the materials with a kind of soul, those notions are basic to a material iconology, and they can be applied across a wide chronological range because they continue to be in play well into the Renaissance, as Michael Cole has shown in his work on Benvenuto Cellini. That play of spirit and matter is an essential part of the iconology of matter in that world, and it also affects the resultant forms, like this box and its functions. In that sense, the watery nature is part of the enlivening action apparent from careful attention to the box itself, perhaps better from careful imagination, because to perform this action is to forget the ways most of us encounter such things as well-lit objects in museum cases. After something is made, the materials remain, obviously, and they continue to do things, like in this case to shimmer and to halate in weak light, to disappear to luster in stronger light, to vacillate between elemental states, apparently even as it glosses and maintains its natural lambent substantiality. The limitations and expansions of life, you might say, are the subject of something like this very mere box. The box can't hide its history as water and earth, ensouled by geological process, and it adapts its nature to the ways the maker forms it. The dappling and denting, its uneven surfaces, are the result of handicraft, not machine work, obviously. And the necessary way maker and materials worked through the sheeting's irregularities demonstrate the box's faceted reflecting and absorbing light. Seeing these aspects, imagining them, really, means working against our own experiences, not just those determined by museums, and re-examining senses and relation to the natural world that we take as natural. Emergent meaning and craft made that so, 
and craftsmen's knowledge and experience of the world were instrumental in this process. But that reality is worth stating because it asserts the distance between a theory of practice and activities based in practice and experience in a craft. It's a difference between reading a language with a dictionary and actually manipulating all potentialities of a language in its diverse forms, or coming close to home, the difference between writing about painting and painting. Our mastery of materials made into things is an easy illusion, and we fall into it all the time. But anyone who's worked by hand on wood or metal realizes that one is necessarily in a compromising position before materials. At variance with the notion of authority in modernism, craft pres presupposes distribution of authorship across makers who work together and also through time. Alex Nagel, in his stimulating recent book, Medieval Modern, glances at mosaic through the lens of Marshall McLuhan's interest in Byzantium. Who knew? In striking ways, McLuhan's notion of authority, Nagel argues, approaches medieval notions. Quote, authorship before print was to a large degree the building of mosaic. Mosaic then has long life in part because of the durability of its materials, but also because of the ongoing work of restoration that takes place on these fields. In effect, mosaics reveal an unstable set of practices with open distributed authorship where revision and restoration are the means by which these things often survive. Craft is clearly in play when mosaic fields are being made and mended, however successful we consider the result or however much we devalue the intervention at all. When interventions occur in painting or sculpture, we're almost always disappointed. The interference by the Medici Medician painters in the Rabula Gospels was not a positive addition for example, and discovering it took a surprising amount of time. When a sculptor recarved this face in the fifth or sixth century, he was evidently making more of a statement and exercising more skill, as it were, than the carver who incised the cross on this head. This act of replacing face with cross is brutal on one level. Perha but perhaps one could also see this alteration as a way for an argument to be made about the indelibility of the cross in all reality. Justin Martyr in the second century was already making claims that the cross is like a Christian DNA that was only visible after the incarnation and crucifixion. Then we can know all of that reality is composed of this building block of life. While unsubtle, this face clearly comprises the cross the meeting of brow and nose that is one of the crosses embedded on the surface of all of our bodies. That victory stamp of cross and inscription demonstrates its reality in the partition of a human face into Christian quadrants. Here certainly is an unstable set of practices that serve to reveal skeleton and leave flesh, and both authors retain some claim to copyright here. This bronze figurine of Dionysus likewise had its active life extended by craftsmen separated by centuries. Cast in the second or third centuries, century, this statuette was more elaborate than it is now in the sense that peg holes reveal it also had a wreath and cloak and of course all four members. But at the end of our period of concern, a, a new craftsman approached the object and revised it for new work. That new work was perhaps twofold, if not uh, more. The presentation in the first place is Psalm 29.3. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord upon many waters. And it's written as a, within a belt resting on the hips of the God. The text begins to the right of the cross, which rests midway between navel and genitals. It doesn't follow the same sinuous curve of the hips, but its straight lines only serve to accentuate, I think, the sensuous S pose of the god. If the cross might be said to be trying too hard, then the cross-shaped monograms on chest and thighs also work at sealing and inoculating. I want to give proper credit to the person who performed these revisions because, to my mind, they're very sensitive to combining what might seem otherwise the incommensurable. The statuette is a fascinating example of an object that was to retain aspects of its original makeup while operating as something quite different at the same time. Irony has to be playing a role here, I think, for that psalm passage was also used at Epiphany for blessing the waters. 
The head, too, underwent revision, and it was opened at the crown to provide room for a small receptacle to hold perhaps oil, water, or wine, something precious at least. One can certainly wish to know more about this piece as well. Its context is not clear since it was found in the Don River in 1867. But the distribution of craft authorship over the surface and its interior is worth noting. While the cloak was likely missing by the time the revisions were made, the craftsman was evidently sensitive to the material qualities of the bronze and respected them to the degree of addressing the contours and surfaces of the figure in a way that the sculptor who intervened in the female head did not. The molten material used in casting was sometimes evocatively, but also in some sense literally, compared to blood. Minerals and ores are like Earth's blood, if not precisely, but blood is in the Earth, and like blood does in the world, it becomes other things while retaining its nature. Hematite, for example, is obviously a bloody remnant in the world congealed somehow within the earth and transformed into a precious stone. And if blood could be stone, the reverse was logically possible. Eusebius tells of marble columns sympathetically weeping their blood before the terrible martyrdom of Anathus. The stoas were forever stained because they refused to relinquish their bloody witness. Blood was also a highly changeable material, altering according to conditions, to breast milk and sperm, for example. It also extended itself into the natural world again, for example, as honey, all the more powerful because it is an excretion by bees, but incorruptible, and paradoxically, like breast milk, an almost miraculous nutrient. I'm trying to suggest here some of the things bronze was in this world, along with other cognate phenomena that have, of course, very different meanings for us. I can indicate then some of these lexical cognates. Blood was another constituent material in the world that carries with it animation as an inspiriting, enlivening element. The miracle and wonder, the miracle and wonder of this element are fantastic. And they likewise need to inform our view of how bronze and its working was understood in the world from extraordinary skill to world making in its formation and renovation. Matter can be its own self-crafter, too. So deeply is this vivacity of making woven into the world by God. Stones, again, have marvelous power, as Philostratus said, one of which is to give birth. Wonder arises not only from materials and their nature, but also from intricate work, from miniature fine work, and from the monumental, from every made thing out of our control. The wonder of the shield of Achilles is the first and greatest of such object emotions. Hephaestus, with his golden robot maidens, crafted the, the peerless shield, and to see it as the poet did is the wonder. The root of wonder, thavma in Greek, is to see, and thavma is the uncanny animation of the shield itself. We're prepared for it by Hephaestus' robot apprentices, but nothing can fully cushion the blow of that incredible excess that Homer relates. That thavma is, on one level, an aesthetic pleasure to be had from encountering a work of art. But the power to evoke wonder is not in mimesis, in capturing an evocation of life, but in the very ability of a made thing to produce life out of materials that may have seemed simply inert, unactivated, but turn out to be not so. Some viewers, within the shield itself are caught in moments of awe and wonder before their crafted landscape and their very ability to be in such a living, crafted landscape. But the witness of the shield within the Iliad are not so many, so we're led in other ways to understand how we should understand this made world. In Book 19, Achilles' mother delivers the armor, and the Myrmidons are fearful and look away. They tremble in fear. The surfeit produced by Hephaestus' craft is not for everyone. Achilles, on the other hand, himself experiences a whole range of emotions, from anger that blazes forth like flames, and then he lapses into gladness and delight before bloodthirst strikes him again. This ekphrastic rendering of wonder was, of course, immensely influential throughout antiquity and into the period I'm concerned with. How late antique poets took up the challenge of the shield and its wonder is revealing of attitudes toward made things. Achilles' elite 
controlled viewing may have been a model in archaic and classical Greece, but it no longer applied in late antiquity. Hephaestus is still heroic, an unattainable paragon of craftsmen who continues to stir wonder in those who experience his craft. In Quintus Smyrnaios' post-Homerica from the third century, the shield is full again, quote, of countless other scenes artfully wrought by the deathless hands of cunning Hephaestus. Quintus stressed the lifelikeness in a way that emphasizes also the poet's mediation. The shield here has been made. We're not witnessing Hephaestus making it here. And the life is in Quintus's own craft um, in a self-reflective way. Quintus underlines the importance, though, of know-how. Of know-how. When he describes Odysseus winning the armor from Ajax, as seen on this plate, metis is the key here the knowledge that is superior in performing every task that Odysseus possesses in spades. This championing of will and skills in human activities presents the very best model for the enrichment of the world that experienced doing produces. Ekphrasis is consistently dealing in verbal control of visual experience, and that trait is marked in late antique examples of the treatment of Homer's shield Late antique writers on contemporary and still extant monuments give some sense of a related but not direct emulation of that great paradigm of poetic wonder. Sixth century descriptions of Hagia Sophia evoke both the overwhelming maidness of everything and the more than made plenitude, its excessive quality surpassing human skill and making it heaven and earth at the same time. In these descriptions, wonder is also evoked and programming our own reaction. For Paul the Silentiary, the wonder is never ceasing, and his prose travels the heights of Hagia Sophia to make it so. Describing the crafting of this wonder intensifies the experience for us. The mason, he says, weaved together with his hands the slabs of marble that produced effects of fruits on boughs, vines, and wreaths. In other words, confounded orders of existence and making plant and stone indistinguishable. Procopius likewise emphasized his sense of wonder. He wrote, spectacle of great beauty, stupendous to those who see it and incredible to those who hear of it. It possesses ineffable beauty, he said, to the degree that the wonder of the place is simply impenetrable. God's richly wrought craft is at work here. Quote, no matter how much they concentrate their attention on this side and that and examine everything with contracted eyebrows, they are unable to understand the craftsmanship and always depart from there amazed by the perplexing spectacle. The inevitable sense of perceptual shortcoming before this monument and many like it is perhaps shared by all who visit Hagia Sophia even today. Wonder for them, for us, as it was for much of the Middle Ages and early modern period, was a cognitive emotion, a mixture of thought and feeling that is unsettling and irresolvable. The boundaries between the possible and impossible, made and not made, in other words, the boundaries that craft breaches, undermine their very categories of the world. Late antique Thavma was expansive to all senses, and it wasn't restricted to that one sense of sight but extended across all ways of knowing the world through bodies. That relation of bodies to work was in Achilles' shield and another Homerica of late antiquity, and it is in that church, but it is also in the mirror, in the baskets and boxes. Our bodies make judgments of scale, and the enormity of the church and the tininess of the gold box both tell us what human bodies can do. They especially tell us what we didn't know bodies could do until we witnessed them and then miraculous making shocks our world. The thinking hand of the craftsman is in and motivating all these phenomena. The making of small gold reliquaries, for example, reveals in careful looking and imagining more in the object than passive description of the world on the part of the box or its maker. Such objects show that makers and made participated in producing agency through materials and their formation. That agency is never in one's hands fully. It constantly escapes, captivates, and makes things wondrous. Thank you. <laughs>